गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू ग्रेविटास एम पलकी शर्मा उपाध्याय लेट्स गेट स्टार्ट ग्रेविटास प्रेजेंटेड बाय एमिटी यूनिवर्सिटी रैंक्ड अमंगस्ट द टॉप 3% यूनिवर्सिटीज ग्लोबली शकारा सुपर्ब बेस्ट इन नेक्स्ट क्लास Co-powered by Star Health Insurance, the health insurance specialist. In an ideal world, the people of a country decide its fate. In the real world, the political leaders of a country decide its fate. In a geopolitically charged world, foreign powers exert influence through covert and overt means. In a conflict situation, foreign militaries dictate the future. And we've seen all of these scenarios across the world. But what about the future? In future. social media giants will decide the fate of a country its people its government its military in fact it's already happening tonight we'll tell you the story of myanmar where the military has seized power and the people are fighting back but the winner will be decided on facebook facebook is synonymous with the internet in this country and it is proving to be very very powerful it's a story that the world must pay attention to because facebook can make or break governments it is time to regulate big tech before it becomes too big and starts running the world also on the show ethiopia used rape as a tool of war the government has admitted to this it's shocking but it's not surprising we'll bring you a special report on how sexual violence has been used in every conflict by terrorists and governments alike Donald Trump's impeachment trial has thrown up new revelations about the president's covid infection and America's nuclear football it's a story you don't want to miss. Iran is pushing ahead with its nuclear program despite growing global condemnation. A new report shows how its top nuclear scientist was killed with a 1 ton gun. And will India ban bitcoin? Is the government launching India's own cryptocurrency? We'll tell you all about it. We begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. Taking note of some misinformed and misleading comments on social media, India's Ministry of Defence releases a statement on LAC disengagement agreement. Says India has not conceded any territory as a result of this agreement. On the contrary, it has enforced observance and respect for the LAC and prevented any unilateral change in the status quo. Chinese broadcasting regulator bars the BBC from airing their 24-hour news channel. Says its coverage of China violated broadcast guidelines. The regulator says it will not permit the BBC to continue broadcasting in China. Jacob Rees-Mogg, MP and leader of the British House of Commons, in response to requests asking for a debate on the farmers' protests in India, says that agricultural reform remains a domestic policy issue for India and that the UK government will continue to follow the farmers' protests closely. A massive swarm of desert locusts hits Kenya. Teams from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations use small planes to spray pesticide. The UN says that about 3.5 million people in the wider region could be impacted by the new wave of locusts by May. One of the important figures in the pro-choice movement, Martha Lampard, has been charged by the authorities for organizing mass demonstrations in the country. 
Prosecutor's office said that Lampard will face up to eight years in prison for organizing mass demonstrations and breaching virus restrictions. Tokyo 2020 Olympics chief Yoshiro Mori resigns after making sexist comments. Mori had said women talk too much and that meetings lasted longer because they were too competitive. While resigning, Mori acknowledged that his inappropriate statement had caused a lot of chaos and that had led to his decision to step down. Though most of the celebrations have gone virtual this year, the Lunar New Year ushers in the Year of the Ox, bidding farewell to the Year of the Rat. The Year of the Ox symbolizes hard work, usually the busiest holiday season that attracts large crowds. This time, large gatherings were banned to curb the spread of the virus. At least 130 vehicles end up in a massive and deadly car pileup along a stretch of highway in Fort Worth, Texas. At least six people reported dead and several dozen more injured. Aerial images show multiple large vehicles piled on top of one another, with cars crashed and wedged between them. Men's title favorites Novak Djokovic and Dominic Thiem have both survived serious scares in the third round of the Australian Open. World number one Djokovic squandered a two-sets advantage against the American Taylor Fritz, but reeled off four straight games in the fifth set to avoid an upset. Third seed Thiem, on the other hand, was two sets down to the mercurial Nick Kyrgios, but produced a stunning comeback over the next three to clinch victory after three hours and 21 minutes. Bayern Munich have been crowned FIFA Club World Cup champions after a 1-0 victory over Mexican outfit Tigres in Doha. The German giants dominated the match but were repeatedly frustrated until Benjamin Pavard controversially fired into an empty net in the 59th minute. The all-conquering German and European champions have now won six trophies in the last nine months. For three weeks now, we have been tracking the situation in Myanmar. We've reported about almost every key character in the story, like the military that has seized power, the political leadership that remains in detention, China, which has been accused of backing this coup, and the people of Myanmar who are out on the streets protesting. They're putting their life on the line for democracy. But there is one more character in the story that we haven't really spoken about yet. It is the world's largest social media network. I'm talking about Facebook. Yes, Facebook too has a major role to play in Myanmar. Why? Because in Myanmar, Facebook is the internet. Facebook is so big in this country that the military, right after seizing power, placed it under a ban. That's one of the first things that the generals did put a ban on Facebook. Now the people of Myanmar are circumventing that ban. Myanmar's press is using Facebook to report about the protests. These pictures were shared today. Journalists are live streaming from protest sites. Even Myanmar's military is on Facebook. Let's show you their page. It's called Tatmadaw True Information Team. Tatmadaw is what the army is called in Myanmar. Yesterday, the military chief delivered his second address to the nation in less than two weeks. He warned civil servants against joining the pro-democracy protests. The military used Facebook to spread the word, but now Facebook is going after this very account. It is reducing the distribution of content from Myanmar's military. This is technically not a ban. This is an attempt to limit their reach. So fewer people will be able to see the military's posts. Why is Facebook doing this? It says the generals are spreading misinformation, so they are restricting the military's page. And that's not all. Myanmar's military will not be able to censor Facebook in any way because Facebook has suspended their ability to send content removal requests. The social media giant has also promised to protect content in favor of democracy, meaning Facebook will protect posts by the people of Myanmar against their army. And if you're wondering why any of this should matter, we'll tell you why. 
How can Facebook influence what's happening in Myanmar? It cannot dethrone the military, yes, but it can certainly tip the scales in favor of the other side. Like I said, Facebook is very big in this country. Myanmar has a population of 54 million. Around half of these people are on Facebook. Half the population of this country is on Facebook. 90% of the citizens in Myanmar have access to mobile phones with an internet connection. You can imagine the penetration. Facebook reached this country in 2010 and it quickly dominated the market. That's because it allowed people to access Facebook without incurring data charges. The Facebook app came preloaded in new phones in Myanmar. And all of these factors allowed Facebook to penetrate the market in Myanmar and integrate into Myanmar's culture. For many people in Myanmar, Facebook is the internet. It's a habit that they find difficult to give up. So when the coup happened, the people of Myanmar watched it unfold on Facebook. The military banned the platform, but the protesters are still using it to mobilize, to gather support and to connect with each other. A new civil disobedience page was set up days after the coup. It's got nearly 200,000 followers in just a few days. And a hashtag with the same name is now, has now been used millions of times. Facebook had a role to play in Myanmar's election as well. Before the voting began in November, Facebook took down 70 fake accounts and pages. Reports say that they were operated by the military. These accounts either shared positive content about the army or criticized Aung San Suu Kyi and her party. Facebook removed them. Content about the alleged voter fraud was also on Facebook. Now that's the reason, remember, that the military gave to seize power. It said that the election had been rigged. It's a different matter that they've not yet produced any evidence to show rigging. Nonetheless, since October last year, posts about voter fraud began appearing on Facebook. And 48 hours before the coup, many of these pages called for military intervention. So the first signs of a coup in Myanmar were also seen on social media. Facebook woke up to these posts and just before it was banned, dozens of accounts were closed. More misinformation has appeared on the platform since. By restricting the military's accounts, Facebook has declared its intent. It wants to aggressively moderate the posts coming out of Myanmar. It is no more a tech company or a media sharing platform. Facebook is an active party to the political churn in Myanmar. And its record in this country is far from perfect. The numbers speak for themselves. Facebook is the digital tea shop for Myanmar. It has a history in this country. It's played a role in the Rohingya refugee crisis and the genocide before it. Facebook incited violence against Rohingyas. We are not saying this. This was the assessment of United Nations investigators two years ago. Facebook incited violence. Our next report tells you more about Facebook's role and history in Myanmar. The Rohingya refugee crisis began with an alleged genocide in the Rakhine state. Thousands died. Lakhs were displaced. All this happened almost five years ago. To this day, the world doesn't know the exact number of casualties. The displacement of Rohingyas was one of the biggest humanitarian crises of this century, and a social networking giant fueled it. UN investigators found that Facebook played a leading role in the alleged genocide. I'm afraid that Facebook has now turned into a beast and not what it originally intended. It was used to convey public messages, but we know that the ultra-nationalist Buddhists have their own Facebooks and are really inciting a lot of violence and a lot of hatred against the Rohingya or other ethnic minorities. The revelations were shocking. The UN investigators named Facebook in their report, calling it a useful instrument to spread hate. Another report claims Facebook was turned into a tool for ethnic cleansing in Myanmar. With the military driving the anti-Rohingya propaganda through posts that incited murder and rape. Stories like these, along with the revelations from the UN investigators, did not go unnoticed in Washington. 
When Mark Zuckerberg appeared before lawmakers around three years ago, he was grilled over Facebook's role in Myanmar's genocide. A lawmaker called Facebook the breeding ground for hate speech against Rohingyas. She showed a post. It called for the death of Muslim journalists in Myanmar. Reports say Facebook had initially refused to take down this post. Zuckerberg admitted a lot more needs to be done. But he hasn't really done it. An investigation by news agency Reuters found that thousands of hate posts were still up even after Zuckerberg's pledge to the U.S. lawmakers. One of them called on the people to fight the Rohingyas, the way Hitler did the Jews. Another post showed a news article from an army-controlled publication. A user here wrote about destroying the Rohingya race. The public scrutiny forced Facebook to act. By December 2018, it removed 425 Facebook pages 17 Facebook groups, and 15 Instagram accounts. Facebook claimed these accounts were disguised as news and entertainment pages, but they actually belonged to Myanmar's military. In addition, 20 individuals and organizations were banned. This included General Min Ong Lain, the commander-in-chief of Myanmar's armed forces, the same general who led the coup in Myanmar. For those who lost their lives in Rakhine, this ban was simply too little, too late. Three years after it banned the general, Facebook now faces the challenge of protecting Myanmar's democracy. The company has vowed to be on the right side of history this time. In an internal message, a Facebook official said they are proactively moderating content on the platform. But military agents could still be infiltrating online groups to sow distrust. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Social media is a double-edged sword. It can spark revolutions. But it can also fuel disinformation, unrest and anarchy. Let's begin with the first aspect. Social media being a platform for the voiceless, a tool for dissent. Myanmar is not the first country to understand this or to witness this. In the last two decades, we've seen multiple movements in different parts of the world, all powered by the ability to share and receive information online. When the Arab Spring erupted in 2010, one of the first things that people noticed was the very visible role that Facebook played. Protesters were armed with cell phones. The movement spread at social media speed. Videos of the revolution went viral on Facebook from Tunisia to Egypt to Yemen to Libya. At least four long-standing authoritarian regimes with decades of power invested in a few people fell in a matter of weeks, all thanks to Facebook. In 2014, something similar happened in Ukraine. A Facebook post by a journalist started the Euro Maidan revolution. Thousands went to Independence Square in Kiev, popularly known as the Maidan. They stayed there, they relayed news through Facebook, and they turned the area into a fortress. The revolution began in November 2014. By February 2015, the Ukrainian government had been overthrown. Again, social media played a big part in this. At the same time, social media also amplified fake news, continues to do so. Facebook relies on crowdsourced information. So anybody can post, any story can go viral. And by the time you realize it's fake, it's already traveled halfway across the world. Keep chasing it then. Social media has contributed to the spread of misinformation and fake news. And this is further fueled by Facebook's algorithms and echo chambers. They're designed to show posts and stories that one will agree with. They're designed to hide the rest. I'm sure you've noticed this pattern. We all have our news feeds filled with articles and political opinions that we feel we could have written ourselves. This is where Facebook should be held accountable. It feeds you what you'd like to believe, even if it may be false. When Donald Trump supporters stormed Capitol Hill, they were convinced that the election had been rigged in the U.S. Many of them were part of an alternate reality. Some believed that dead people had voted in the election. Some others felt that a powerful cabal of Democrats was trafficking and abusing children. Where did they get this information? On social media. The political power of Facebook cannot be underestimated. 
In the 2010 U.S. midterm election, researchers analyzed political messages delivered to 61 million Facebook users. Do you know what they found? Messages influence voters. Their political self-expression, information seeking and real world voting behavior. And sometimes these political messages are hijacked. Take the example of Russia's infamous Internet Research Agency, IRA, that operates from St. Petersburg. Reports say it tried influencing the U.S. election. Facebook itself revealed that during the 2016 presidential election in the U.S., the IRA purchased ads worth 100,000 U.S. dollars. And 25% of these ads were geographically targeted to American voters. Facebook's chief of security admitted that these ads spread disinformation. They promoted discord. They stirred up chaos. Closer home, we had the Cambridge Analytica data scandal. The data of at least 87 million Facebook users was harvested without consent. It was then used for targeted political advertising. How did all of this happen? Mark Zuckerberg was questioned about this, and this was his response. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility. And that was a mistake, and I'm sorry for it. Sorry, is all he had to say. The bottom line is this. In Myanmar, Facebook may serve as the tool for people demanding democracy. But at the end of the day, it's only a tool. Anybody can wield such a tool. A few years back, Facebook was used as a tool to promote violence, to incite violence in the very same country. It's a tool that's proving to be more powerful than governments. And it's important to regulate it before it's too late. Let's talk about Ethiopia, where the government of Abi Ahmed has admitted that rape is being used as a tool of war in the ongoing Tigray conflict. Let that sink in. Ethiopia's own federal forces are guilty of this heinous crime, rape, as a tool of war. It's shocking but not surprising. From the Taliban in Afghanistan to the Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria to the persecution of Uyghur women in China, rape and sexual violence has been used in every conflict, both by terrorists and governments. Here's a report. Situated in the Horn of Africa is Ethiopia, a landlocked country of about 114 million inhabitants. Since November 2020, the Tigray region in the country's north has been embroiled in an armed conflict. A war between the Tigray People's Liberation Front and forces supporting Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. In January this year, the United Nations revealed that it had received disturbing reports about the rampant use of sexual violence in the conflict. This included reports of individuals being forced to rape members of their own family. Well, we're seeing what some people have termed as a bold uh, move by the government to admit that indeed sexual abuse was done in the northern region where we know the government has had a military operation since November of last year. Well, this is something that was flagged up by some international agencies and some local citizens, uh, but we never really saw the government coming out to admit. So this admission is the fact that, uh, I mean, it, for some people say uh, it's a good thing because then that means the government really sees how grave the situation is and it might really help the people or the victims of sexual abuse because now the government then is moving in to, to offer mental support and asking for more help internationally and locally to be able to give mental support physical support to those who have been affected well it is a bit sad and very sad actually for those who have been affected and it kind of opens up a different kind of wound uh, where people are looking beyond the military operation and saying that uh, targeting the women and, and female gender on the other side of the northern region is really unfortunate the Ethiopian government has now admitted to this grim reality Rape is indeed being used as a tactic of war in Ethiopia. Scores of women have been raped since the conflict began. The state-appointed Ethiopian Rights Commission says that 108 rapes have taken place in the last two months alone. Many others have gone unreported. 
Victims have identified their abusers as both federal forces and the liberation troops. Most of them say that they were offered a harrowing choice by their tormentors, be raped or be killed. According to the commission, medical centers have indicated an increase in the demand for emergency contraception and testing for sexually transmitted infections. The revelations may be appalling, but they are not surprising. From the Taliban in Afghanistan to ISIS in Iraq and Boko Haram in Nigeria, rape has been used as a weapon of war by insurgents and terror groups across the world. In some cases, even governments employ this brutal weapon. Case in point, China where Uyghur women have been subjected to years of state-sponsored rape. The victims and eyewitnesses have now started sharing their ordeal with the world. Here the Uyghur women are raped by one or more masked Chinese men. These are statements from detainees, the ones who managed to escape from China. They're the ones telling the story. In Africa, women suffer at the hands of those who come in the garb of saviors and aid givers. In 2020, Human Rights Watch issued a report. UN peacekeeping forces were accused of raping women and children in the Central African Republic. And now, Ethiopia admits that federal forces raped women in Tigray, that they used sexual violence as an act of war. A conflict affects a whole population, but rape is a weapon wielded exclusively against women. The trauma of which only they must suffer. What has happened in Ethiopia should serve as a wake-up call for the rest of the world. Bureau Report, We On, World is One. It's been a while since we discussed Captain Chaos, Donald Trump. Last we checked, he was on an impeachment trial for inciting an insurrection. After two days of some rather emotional arguments, the Democrats have rested their case. In a sweeping summary of their evidence, the House, of, the House prosecutor said that they had proven their charge, that Donald Trump incited the insurrection at Capitol Hill, and that he showed no remorse for an attack that left five people dead. They also insisted that the U.S. Senate's refusal to punish him could pave the way for a future commander-in-chief to subvert the democratic process. We humbly, humbly ask you to convict President Trump for the crime for which he is overwhelmingly guilty of. Because if you don't, if we pretend this didn't happen, or worse, if we let it go unanswered, who's to say it won't happen again? Fair point. And here's another crime that many say Donald Trump is guilty of, hiding the severity of his COVID situation. Remember, he tested positive for the Wuhan virus last year, on the 2nd of October last year to be precise. After downplaying the threat for months, Donald Trump himself tested positive. This was just 31 days before the U.S. presidential election. Now, people familiar with the president's health have revealed that he was sicker. His condition was worse than he publicly admitted. In fact, his COVID situation was apparently so concerning that doctors at one point thought of putting him on a ventilator. He reportedly had extremely depressed blood oxygen levels and a lung problem associated with pneumonia caused by the virus. But Trump's medical team at the Walter Reed Hospital reportedly downplayed the severity of the situation. Anyway, all's well that ends well. Trump was out and about in a matter of days. He contested an election. He fought till the last moment to stay on in power. He was last seen golfing on the eve of his impeachment trial. As prosecutors in Washington presented videos of him inciting violence at Capitol Hill, speaking of which, a stunning video from the impeachment trial is now going viral. It shows former Vice President Mike Pence rushing to safety as a military aide follows him with a huge briefcase. Look at it very closely. Do you know what this is? 
the nuclear football as they call it. It's an emergency bag which has a combination of tools which a president can use in case of a nuclear war. It's called the nuclear football. The American president has the sole authority to do so. But a duplicate briefcase also accompanies the vice president. This was that briefcase. This is how close America's codes were from falling into the wrong hands. There was more in jeopardy than just American democracy last month. Meanwhile, in West Asia, tensions are peaking. A new report has come out about the assassination of Iran's top nuclear scientist, Mohsin Fakhri Zadeh. He was killed last year, turns out, by a one-ton gun. A gun that was smuggled into Iran, reportedly by agents of Mossad. Now threats are flying. Here's a report. When Iran's top nuclear scientist, Mohsin Fakhri Zadeh, was killed, Iran vowed to find and punish those behind his death. It was a clear threat to Israel. Now Tehran has another reason to train its guns on its arch rival. A report has come out. It claims the operation to assassinate Mohsin Fakhri Zadeh, plotted by Mossad, the notorious Israeli spy agency. And that's not all. The plan was carried out inside Israeli territory. According to this report, a one-ton automated gun was smuggled into Tehran piece by piece. More than 20 members of Mossad were behind this operation. The team included both Israeli and Iranian nationals. Mohsin Fakhri Zadeh died last year in November in a roadside ambush after a truck explosion. Iranian officials were quick to blame Israel for the attack, claiming it was carried out using sophisticated electronic devices. While Israel never claimed responsibility for the attack, its Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had identified Fakhri Zadeh as the man behind Iran's nuclear program. And you will not be surprised to hear that Sapan is led by the same person who led Project Ahmad, Dr. Fakhri Zadeh, and also, not coincidentally, many of Sapan's key personnel worked under Fakhri Zadeh on Project Ahmad. So this atomic archive clearly shows that Iran planned at the highest levels to continue work related to nuclear weapons under different guises and using the same personnel. Fakhri Zadeh was long suspected of masterminding a secret nuclear bomb program for Iran. With that kind of scrutiny, many had assumed that he would be on target of Israeli security officials. According to the Jewish Chronicle, the Israelis had secretly assessed that Fakhri Zadeh's replacement will be fully operational only after six years. And it would take Iran two years to get the bomb. Fakhri Zadeh's death was seen as a major setback to Iran's nuclear program. But Tehran has not slowed down. Reports say it has started producing uranium metal that can be used as a component in nuclear weapons. This is another breach of the 2015 nuclear deal. France, Germany and the United Kingdom have condemned Tehran's move. Iran is said to be far from achieving the required levels of uranium metal for a weapon. It is building pressure, though, on Washington for a negotiation. اون کسی که اون کشوری که از تعهد خارج شده به مدت حدود سه سال U.S. President Joe Biden has said the sanctions in Iran will not be lifted for talks. But after the declaration from Tehran, the ball is back in America's court. It remains to be seen who blinks first. Bureau report, we on, world is one. Let's talk about the pandemic now. In countries like India, it appears all but over. But in the West, new variants of the Wuhan virus have emerged, some more infectious and lethal than the one that started the pandemic. The variant of concern now is the one first discovered in the UK. It forced the country into lockdown in December and set off alarm bells in Europe. 
It is now spreading rapidly in the United States. Infections are doubling every 10 days. Scientists say this could become the world's dominant strain. More contagious, more lethal and more dangerous. The new variant of the Wuhan virus that has swept across the United Kingdom might just sweep the world in all probability. What's really um, affected us at the moment is transmissibility because the new variant has swept the country, is going to sweep the world in all probability. The head of UK's genetic surveillance programme, Professor Sharon Peacock, was talking about the mutated virus strain found in Britain. The variant was first found in the southeastern county of Kent. After being identified in September 2020, the variant is now found in over 50 countries. It has led to new lockdowns in the UK and to a rise in global panic. The strain of the Wuhan virus is found to be 70% more infectious and 30% more lethal. The new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group has designated it as a variant of concern. The British advisory body is concerned about this variant's potential to undermine the shots. I think that what's concerning about this is that the 117 variant that we've had circulating for some weeks or months is beginning to mutate again and get new mutations which could affect uh, the way that we handle the virus in terms of immunity and the effectiveness of, of, of vaccines. And so I think it's concerning that the 117, uh, which is more transmissible and um, which has swept the country, is now mutating uh, to have this new uh, mutation uh, uh, that could threaten vaccination. The Kent variant is now spreading rapidly in the United States, doubling roughly every 10 days as per latest reports. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has warned that Kent variant could become the dominant strain in the U.S. by March. The findings are alarming. There are as many as a thousand different versions of the Wuhan virus circulating in the world. Experts are concerned about a few, namely the variants detected in South Africa and Brazil. However, the Kent variant is setting off alarm bells across the world, even more so in Britain's neighborhood. The experts tell us that the mutated virus could gain the upper hand over the previous one. And that's why the period between now and mid-March is very essential. Certain measures will remain in place, which also applies until 15th of March. It is not unexpected that new variants have developed. All viruses mutate as they make copies of themselves to spread and thrive. But some can be more infectious and threatening. So will the vaccines work? Current vaccines were designed around earlier versions of the virus. But scientists believe they should still work against new ones. What we know is that the vaccine is effective. We strongly believe that it is effective against severe disease. And that's important. And that's a very good reason to get vaccinated. Quibbles about whether how, how infectious you might be or whether it might be a bit less infectious, effective against minor disease shouldn't stop people from getting a vaccine that, that's going to stop you getting killed by this disease. What is being done about the new threat? Scientists around the world are on the lookout for all emerging variants. Vaccine makers are already working on updating the existing shots. The British government has announced a deal with biopharma company CureVac to develop vaccines against future strains. And the FDA is closely monitoring the new mutations. We do know that the 117, the one that is the UK as it were, the one that we're concerned that over the next month or so it might become dominant. If you look at the antibodies that are induced by the vaccines that we use, they do very well in vitro in the test tube against the B117 variant. New variants will emerge, but every new emergence doesn't imply public health crisis. Different strains have different impacts. Along with the observations and findings, the mechanisms to deal with the new crisis will develop with time. And so will the medication, for better or worse. Bureau Report, we on World is One. More than $48,000 for $8,000.
That was the price of one Bitcoin four days ago. It's arguably the most popular digital currency right now. Should you invest in it? Perhaps not if you're in India. The government of India could ban it soon. Reports say the Reserve Bank of India could introduce its own cryptocurrency. What will this mean for the 7 million cryptocurrency investors in India? Our next report has the details. If the recent Bitcoin rally has left you wondering if you should take the plunge, we say hold your horses. The government of India is mulling a Bitcoin ban. According to reports, India will impose a complete ban on cryptocurrencies. According to one estimate, 7 million investors hold cryptocurrencies in India worth more than $1 billion. They will be given time to move their cash out. The proposed ban is part of a comprehensive bill on crypto and digital currencies. It may be introduced in the ongoing budget session of India's parliament. Does this mean the end of the road for cryptocurrencies in India? Not really. The bill may include certain exceptions. They could allow the promotion of the underlying technology like blockchain, the decentralized digital ledger that drives all types of cryptocurrencies. An exception like this could provide the legal framework for the Reserve Bank of India to launch its official digital currency. China has a similar regulatory regime. It effectively banned trading and usage of cryptocurrencies in 2017. Crypto exchanges were shut down. Last year, Beijing began testing its own digital currency in four cities. India's move to regulate digital cash comes at a time when the world is increasingly adopting it. Mastercard and Visa have opened their payments network for some cryptocurrencies. Customers using these platforms can now pay or accept money through crypto. Recently, auto giant Tesla made a big bet on Bitcoin. The company bought more than $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. It also allowed customers to pay through Bitcoin for its products. The trend is inexorable. I think that, that not just with Bitcoin, but other cryptocurrencies, stable coins, Tether, things like that, that those will become uh, transactable currencies increasingly over the next five years. It's not going to happen overnight. Cryptocurrencies are now part of the mainstream global financial system. India cannot afford to ignore this shift. But first, it needs a legal framework to deal with this. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Can you find the perfect apartment with cryptocurrency? It may be tough, but on the internet, people seem to have found the worst apartment. It's in New York. It's tiny with just one room, no bathroom, no kitchen, but it will burn a hole in your pocket. Our next report tells you what $1,600 will fetch you in one of the, the finest locations of New York. And before you ask, yes, this is a real apartment. This they're small, they're spine-sized, and then this. In New York City. What you're looking at yes, is an apartment. Is apartment. We don't know this the exact address, but it's somewhere in New York. In the most and the owner wants $1,650 a month. If you're waiting to see the rest of the unit, don't, because this is it. Neighborhood One room, city. no bathroom, no stove. This is what $1,650 will fetch you in prime New York. Singular closet. Zero oven, one mini fridge. No the realtor uploaded his apartment walk around on social media. It immediately went viral, garnering more than 40,000 comments and 20 million views. But the verdict is not unanimous. For some users, it was all too real. They say real estate in New York is actually this expensive. And they aren't completely wrong. Deutsche Bank listed New York as the third most expensive city to rent in behind Hong Kong and San Francisco. The average rent in Manhattan is $3,790 for a 700 square feet apartment. But even by New York's ridiculous standards, this apartment is overpriced. Realizing this, house hunters went on a roasting spree. 
One user likened the unit to Harry Potter's tiny cupboard room below the stairs. Another said it was more of a compartment than an apartment. And it's difficult to disagree. The unit does not have a bathroom. For that, you'll have to go downstairs and use the common one. What it does have is a tiny closet. Ironic since the apartment itself isn't much bigger than your average closet. But this isn't a pan-American phenomenon. Outside New York, rates aren't as absurd. In Texas, you could rent a 2,000 square feet house for half the money. The same in most global cities. In Hong Kong, you could rent out a 2 BHK for $3,685. In San Francisco, for $2,909. And in Zurich, for $2,538. And these are listed as the most expensive cities to live in. But here's the thing about New York. This apartment won't be empty for long. It is apparently located in one of the most desirable localities in the city. And here, it's the location that matters to most people. Not the facilities and size. So don't be surprised if someone snaps this unit up in a couple of days. And before you Being ask, branded yeah, the world's worst apartment may have come as a publicity boom. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. And finally, the story of hope and inspiration of beating the odds in the most beautiful of ways. A girl born without arms is now a ballerina in Brazil. Her indomitable spirit has resonated with many and turned her into a social media star. Here's her story. Life has not been easy for Vittoria Bueno. Born without arms, her struggles would give sleepless nights to her mother. But today, watching her glide and pirouette effortlessly in a ballet studio, the only emotion that her parents feel is pride. In casa, o, o dia dela é como se ela tivesse. At home, her day is like she has both arms. What she does is amazing. What she does with the feet, I can't do with my hand. Victoria, now 16, is a regular at the Ballet Academy in her hometown in the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil. She has been training since she was five years old and can perform jazz moves and tap dance too. But life wasn't always easy for her. When she was younger, her disability made her a social curiosity. She would go for a walk and people would pull up shirt sleeves to see. People hurt me. Her disability scared me. But it didn't hurt as much as people's attitude. Speak to Vittoria and you will find a confident girl with big dreams who wouldn't let her disability get in the way of her grand plans. For me, my arms are just a detail. I dance, I follow with my eyes as if they were there. However, there is no difficulty or need to have them. I don't feel like I need them at all. For people with disabilities, it helps a lot. They see that disabilities are just a detail. We are much bigger than our disabilities. So we have to chase our dreams. Her tryst with ballet began when her physiotherapist advised her to practice the form and now the strength and flexibility gained through ballet has made her more independent. I said to Victoria, follow their arms as if they were there. Then imagine that your arms were there and follow them with your head. Everything we have been doing with our arms, she does with her head, even for the dances. The timing of the music, everything was done with the head. <laughs> Victoria is now a role model for many. Her story is one for the books. As she glides across the stage, it is evident that nothing can stop her dreams from taking flight. Bureau Report, we on World is One. You could say we saved the best for the last. Of all the stories that we've shown you this week, let this one stay with you as you head into the weekend. We hope it inspires some of you, if not all. We're slipping into a short break. Up next, Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching. Have a good weekend.
Video now available in the United States. Download the app now. From the world's most volatile region, conflicts over faith and boundaries. Stories of death, destruction, despair, and hope. Weon brings you to the heart of the action. Incisive analysis.